Hi everyone and welcome to Cherry Red TV. Today we're going to take a look across the career of a band that achieved the notable feat of having major chart success whilst also being very innovative with their sound. The band is Red Box and I'm joined in the studio today by founder member and frontman Simon Tolson Clark. Welcome Simon. Thank you very much. So if you can just kick things off by giving us a brief potted history in terms of how Red Box came together. Uh, Red Box uh, met at university. Uh, we formed, uh, I think, in about 1979 at the Polytechnic of Central London, uh, where we began to do a few uh, in-college gigs. Uh, we met um, shortly after beginning to write and try and record our own music. Uh, at the end of the 70s, we met a, a producer called Phil Brown, who offered us free studio time. So we made demos, uh, which we took around the, the venues uh, in London and um, really started to gather a following. Um, uh, at the same time, we were trying to make, as you say, uh, a different sound um, out of our what we knew was essentially pop music at that stage. Um, and we, uh, we really grew it from that. Um, eventually ending up uh, in Cherry Red's offices with a ma finished master of one of our early songs. Um, uh, so did, did the band sort of, as individuals, bring a very kind of different set of influences for each person into the band? Yeah, I think that that always is the case. And the, and the best bands um, really evolve. I, th I think um, you are drawn to people with certain sim similar tastes as you, and we were in those days. Uh, my main partner in terms of songwriting and driving the band in, in those days was called, uh, is called Julian Close. And he had a number of influences that I think were, were different from mine but worked very well. We had quite an eclectic record collection anyway as a group of people. I think it was the, they were the first people that I had met who also listened to uh, sort of world music, which in the 70s was was you know really only beginning to be heard here uh, in, in in any kind of uh, purchasable form. And I gather that there was quite a notorious 70s band that had uh, some responsibility at least for the band's name. Yeah, uh, I ended up uh, as the guy who booked the groups at the Polytechnic, Polytechnic and uh, I booked Slade to do a Freshers Bull and they came and they, they were incredibly loud, is pretty much my only memory of Slade. Uh, but when they left, they left a flight case, uh, in a very nice red flight case. Um, and I, I phoned Chas Chandler, who was the manager of the band, on the Monday and said, look, they left, uh, you know, the band left a flight case, it's, it's pretty nice, and he went, fucking keep it. <laughs> <laughs> so we kept it and we, we stored microphones and leads and stuff in it. Uh, I've still got it, in fact. But much later, uh, we were having a conversation about what the name of the group should have been, should be, in a rehearsal. And basically, I was taking flack because we'd had a, um, an extensive list of possibilities pinned up uh, on the wardrobe in the flat we shared, uh, it, which is um, the tower block that looks over the motorway in Notting Hill, okay. uh, Latimer Road. And... Uh, everybody uh, had a, their own favourites, but, but basically... I felt there wasn't a convincing name on the list. Somebody started to criticise my, my point of view during the rehearsal and said, the thing is, Si, if, if somebody pointed at one of the things in this room, you know, like a uh, camera tripod or heater, you would say it's, a, it's not a good name for a band, but that's probably how they got the doors. You know, somebody went doors. And it's just how you associate the music and it's how you associate the personality of the band, you invest that into the name eventually. I mean, I don't really think of Rapid Eye Movement when I think of R.E.M. I just think of them and the music. The sound, yeah. it's, I, I've kind of gone past that. So um, I thought he had a good point. And uh, while he was saying it, he said, I could just say, you know, like Red Box, because we called it the Red Box. And uh, the drummer said, actually, that's quite a good name. And we, <laughs> we sort of laughed, but it went on the list. And then later, I was reading, literally a few days later, I was reading um, a book um, called um, Strange Man in the Aglala, and it's about Crazy Horse. It's basically the, the story of Crazy Horse, his, the biography. And in it, I learned that uh, the Sioux Indians uh, uh, had no uh, written word, but their symbol for a man was a circle. 
uh, and their symbol for the white man was a square because they, they were fascinated by the square paddocks that he built and the square log cabins and the square money. Um, so that became the symbol for, for the other people that they'd met who happened to be white. So I started to think Red Box actually was, was a much cooler name. Uh, I was a student and I was very pretentious. <laughs> Apologise. <laughs> yeah, I've read actually that um, you sort of said that the members of the band at that time considered themselves student activists. Were sort of yeah. political and social issues very important to you as individuals and did yeah. they shape the band in any way? Yeah, I think they did. Uh, and I think particularly in the early days. I mean, you, you know, you may say... How does a band be student activists and end up on a major label? And it's a good point. I, th I think we were active politically in the late 70s and early 80s, as, as many people of our generation were, who were in higher education. And I consider it to be, you know, a really important part of me, um, values um, that perhaps I hadn't learnt by the time I was 20, uh, and I saw, uh, you know, I was meeting people uh, out of my social circle. You know, I'm middle class and I'm white. And in musical terms, this meant that I'd come through a certain set of influences. But at Polytechnic and in London for the first time, I was thrown into a, what was essentially a microcosm of the city. It was a hugely multicultural university. Uh, and I think that its political activism definitely motivated me to look a little further um, in, in every way, musically. So I have, a, I think, you know, a debt as a person to that. Uh, and I still hold most of those beliefs. Uh, I'm, I'm middle-aged now and I'm a realist. I have a child. Um, so I, I think what I would say is that at that time I was attempting to write songs that, about changing the world or... Yeah. Where, that, where I felt there was some sort of consensus that I missed. Even where, even at football, I, I really almost found myself crying, not necessarily if my team were doing well, but just the fact that here I was with several thousand people who wanted the same thing. Yeah. You know, and I, I was always uplifted by that. And I think Lean On Me is, a, is, is that kind of sentiment, and there were a, any number of others off, the, off our first album. So um, when, you, when you started playing... Um, in the live sense, you kind of quite quickly gathered a, a good fan base around the London club circuit. We did, and I think that there were two two reasons for that mainly. I think one, one we were very well connected socially because we were still at university, so we had loads of friends who brought friends. But the other was, I think, that we were attempting to make uh, our songs. Julian and I were very passionate about trying to make the band sound not unique, but... Um, uh, recognisable. All our favourite groups, all our favourite artists of our f throughout the teenage years and and our twenties had that about them. And I think that was one thing that was common to everybody in the band at that stage, was that I, I was a big David Bowie fan, as was Julian. Uh, T Rex were uh, were kind of landmark group uh, in my early teens. And I think you could put any of those records on and instantly re recognise who who was making it, even if it was just the instrumental introduction. Yeah. And the 80s seemed to be about sameness, and it got worse, you know. And I don't, I don't, I don't want to come across as a grumpy old man, but I think that there was a certain sound to the 80s, and it's much criticised, and rightly, because it's a bit, it's a bit polished it's a little slippy it's a bit big and reverb terms but if we're going to be technical about it most of the influences that were, were exerted upon songwriters who made records in the 80s were 70s influences yeah. and actually came from a much drier recording style uh, you know west coast music is, is very warm i think the music the music in the 80s perhaps suffered a little bit at the hands of technology yeah but there were some amazing records made and amazing groups you know pretenders were an 80s group proper real uh, great band. So sorry, I've waffled on there. <laughs> That's right. But I, what I was going to say was, I think as we got, as I got older, my songs stopped maybe trying to change, you know, the world, uh, and became more intent on changing my world, you know, the, my, my sort of personal world. Um, that isn't to say that I don't still have passionate feelings about it, um, but I think it's a very fine line uh, of being interesting and innovative 
while still trying to carry a, a decent message, a moral message. Uh, and this is not the reason for pop music, but it's one of the great things pop music has not occasionally done. Um, I think it's a very fine line between that and being a bit overly preachy. I just now feel... I can now see what I don't know, yeah. which at the time I probably couldn't. I was quite arrogant. Well, I think many people have that that uh, strand in their youth. Well, I think such. it's an advantage if you're trying to make it, uh, you know, in your early in your early years as a, an artist. Then definitely a little bit of arrogance and uh, perhaps a lack of reality about your real talent helps. So you sort of um, then move to the early recording stage. Yes, and um, one of the songs that you uh, laid down in that first set of recordings was called Chenko. Yes. Which eventually became your first single. Yes, it did. When you were when you were writing and recording it, did it feel like a a real sort of breakthrough to you at the time? Yeah, it was actually a, a real, um, and I, I think we've been. I think Julian and I at the time spoke about this that it was a kind of landmark moment for us writing. The basic relationship within the band was that I did the songwriting. Uh, and I think uh, Julian would admit what he always was was a kind of A and R man within the band, which was a, which actually was a very powerful thing to have indeed. Um, but he said very early on that chorus has a has a kind of memorable quality. It's quite instant. You know, you could make a pop record from what you're doing. At the time, I was actually writing it slower. I found that that's something that I've done a lot. Is while I'm writing it. Yeah, the tempo tends to be slower than it eventually will be. I think it's because I'm a bit thick and I need thinking time <laughs> between chords. Uh, so, but it, it was a slower song and Julian suggested I speed it up. At the time, we were, um, we were sort of uh, in our ivory tower on the 19th floor in, in Latimer Road with a porter studio trying to work out how this song I'd written on an acoustic guitar uh, translated. And I, I had... Um, at the time, I developed the, the something that stayed with us as a band ever since, which is that I just sing complete rubbish. Uh, well, you probably think most of the time, but in the early stages of writing, I just sing um, phonetically. Yeah. And sometimes we get very good, uh, prescient meaning from it. Uh, other times I simply go back and I write words with a narrative. But it's quite difficult because I'm often trying to match what it is inevitably quite vowely. And if you sustain notes as a singer, you know that the vowels and, uh, are much e easier to sustain. I think that also formed part of the sound of the of the band in the early days, was that Ali Ayo, Lean On Me, and Chenko Tenko Aya were all just things I happened to sing. So I then worked, tried to work out why I was singing them and tried to bring some meaning into it. So it's, it's almost songwriting from, the, from a reverse standpoint. And there wasn't actually a label involved when you went and did those recordings, was that you kind of paid for them off your own back as such? We did. Um, Phil Brown, uh, our producer friend, had, had offered on numerous occasions to record us free of charge from his point of view if we wanted to make a master recording. We'd done an, a few days with him here and there uh, in downtime or in, at other studios to make demos, but this was a, a, a whole leap of... Um, in terms of uh, evolution and standard of recording. Um, so we needed to raise, I think it was about 1,500 quid um, to make the recording and master the record and therefore have something that we could actually go to a record company. We figured we would need to go to a lot of record companies. I think I'd read somewhere that one of my favourite songwriters had been to 80 record companies before he got a deal. That was Don McLean. Okay. I believe, I don't know... I know, I know McNay's in the building and he'll probably correct me, but uh, I, I think he did shop that uh, American Pie album around a lot and it had songs like Crossroads on it and, and uh, of course, the, the big hits uh, as well. So that was, uh, I was prepared to go to a lot of places. When we actually finished our self-financed recording, we, we, the first place we went to was Cherry Red because Phil kind of remembered doing something with them. And, of course, uh, uh, John Hollingsworth, the A&R man, uh, loved it, so we were lucky in the, in the, the first place that we tried to place the record. We we raised the money to make that record by selling um, an Adams fireplace from a from a building in Bloomsbury. I've just remembered where it is, and um, 
yeah, we had some friends who were living in the building and considered that they didn't need the fireplace and that this was as good a cause as any. So eventually you were picked up by this damn fine label, Cherry Fantastic. Red Records. Yeah. Uh, at the time, you were in uh, Westbourne Grove, just off Westbourne Grove. Um, and I think Mute were on the floor below. I think that's right, yeah. Uh, but it was a good vibe. We really liked the people. We were lucky, actually, because when we walked in with the master um, and said, look, we've made a record, will you release it? it the only person there was Kerry, who was on uh, work experience. And fortunately for us, she, she, she had a little bit of gumption and she said, well, I'll play it, you know, put it on. And uh, she said, I, I really like it. So I'd like to hold on to it if I could. And when the head of A&R comes back, I'll play it to him. So we went. We ended up, I think, going back again that day, and we met John and Ian, and went ahead with the deal. And um, the single, I think, did quite well in terms of of gathering airplay, um, although it didn't actually reach the top forty. That's right. And and our deal with Cherry Red was that we would remain with them for the album, should they succeed in making it go top forty, and that I. It, they didn't succeed, but I think they they actually did pretty well, and um, it was you know Cherry Red were responsible for the first for, for one of the greatest experiences anybody who wants to write songs can have, which is unexpectedly hearing your record on the radio for the first time, which happened to me on the way to a rehearsal in Julian's VW Beetle on the M40, and it, and we came on it Capital Radio played our record. Was about two weeks after Cherry Road released it. We, you know, much later, I would know when it was coming on the radio because you would know what the playlists were. But that was a complete, completely unexpected pleasure. Yeah, one of the great moments great. Of, of any band's <laughs> career is to, to hear yeah. the song on the radio for the first time. An amazing, almost like a monkey's episode. We were all in, a, in the one VW Beetle at the time. It was too sick, really. And. Um, one of the things that, of course, that airplay and the association with Cherry Red did for you was to bring you to the attention of Seymour Stein, who was running the Sire label. Yes. Just had all, you know, a massive success introducing Madonna to the world. Global success. And Talking Heads and Prince. Indeed, yeah. yeah. So incredibly successful label. Um, how did that association come out? Because he then sort of took a real interest in the band in terms of moving your career forward. He did, and he, he was a pivotal... It was a pivotal step for us uh, when Seymour became involved. I mean, Seymour is a legendary, a legendary music lover. So given the people he'd signed and given his enthusiasm, it was inevitable that we would want to do this deal. Um, we had an out from the Cherry Red deal because uh, the single hadn't gone top 40, but I think Seymour and the band felt that we would like to include Cherry Red in anything that we went on to do. And so I think the technical term is an override, um, which, which uh, Ian, I know, was, was glad of, um, and particularly because it was heartfelt. Yeah. Um, so, yes, we moved to Sire, which had its um, advantages. I mean, Seymour is um, a really inspiring person to be around, my my experience of Seymour was that he came over, the first time I met him, he was in front of the stage watching us. We didn't know anybody was coming. There was a, a, a this sort of, he looked elderly even in those days, you know, <laughs> with his, uh, he had a silver cane. Um, and he came with some big wigs from um, Warner Brothers in this country and they liked the band. Um, I later found out that Ian Carlisle, our manager, knew they were coming, but he didn't tell me because he thought it would spook me. Right. You know, patronising. <laughs> Probably true, though. Uh, so uh, we, yep, we signed to Sire and began recording what became Circle in the Square. Started, we, I think, if I, if I remember rightly, we started with the Lightly singles. Right. And I think it was the, the third single, am I correct in saying Lean On Me was your third single release overall overall including yeah. the cherry including red, the cherry red yes cherry. yes and you see nowadays we wouldn't have made it we wouldn't have had any pops uh, success because we didn't have that immediate we didn't we weren't immediately successful yeah yeah but that single was incredibly successful number 3 in the UK i think it was number 1 in in six other countries yeah top 5 in 12 countries yeah i mean was that overwhelming at the time that sort of success or did you kind of take it in your stride 
I think we did pretty much take it in in our stride, that aspect of it. I mean, it was very odd because we, we did come from a generation that were inspired by people being in control of their music. And we, we had actually felt no real um, fundamental shift in artistic control when we moved from Cherry Red to Warner Brothers. But uh, I now see that that wasn't the case. I think um, it was overwhelming in terms of how quickly it happened. In those days, you could actually be playing the marquee to 200 f hardcore followers, uh, and literally three weeks later, you could be on top of the pops and be there for turning away people at your next 1,000-seater. It really did have a power in those days uh, to motivate uh, a lot of people at once. And I, I think part of the... Part of the shift has been that now, if there was a chart show on TV that was definitive, I don't think more than 10% of the population would see it. But in those days, Top of the Pops, everybody, everybody, watched, everybody yeah. watched it. Yeah. Somebody told me recently, um, I, had a, I had a chum call me up who, who works as a marketing guy at Ministry of Sound, and he was telling me that he'd had a number one He'd been associated, worked on his first number one, and I congratulated him. He said, actually, it's one of the lowest-selling number ones of all time. And he told me the figure, and I was astounded, because just to show you the shift in the, t in, in, in the time since yeah. the mid-'80s, the single was so powerful then that we were selling, I think at the peak of it, 35,000 copies a day wow. in order to remain where we were. Yeah. And Seymour and Max maintained to this day that we were robbed of a number one and therefore further success for the group because those things have a knock-on effect as you know yeah um and at the time we were quite sort of dismissive we we said rather flippant things in interviews like because everybody did think it was going to go to number one it went up pretty quickly but it coincided with um the biggest selling record of the decade at number one which was power of love of jennifer rush of course, yeah. which was a massive song um and so we missed out on that number one. And at the time, I think we said, that's OK, our next one can go to number one or some, something really p pathetic and unknowing like that. <laughs> but, um, you know, it was a fantastic experience. Uh, and although later we had our problems, um, I think really defining what it was the band were about and what we should be doing with Warner Brothers, they were, um, you know, astoundingly good at giving us those early hits and really getting us off the off the ground. So off the back of that, as you say, you completed the recording for the first album, Circle in the Square, which received a lot of critical. It took a long acclaim. time. Yeah, when it when it was eventually released, it, it did receive a lot of critical acclaim, particularly for the way that you sort of moulded that world music element of your influence into the music. Do you think that's something that the band got? sort of enough credit for in terms of bringing that into the mainstream given that in later years you had the likes of Paul Simon Peter Gabriel Graceland and yeah who had really big hit records but using those influences well I just I mean you know I'm flattered I feel a bit pretentious sitting here to be honest being interviewed about my music we're talking about Paul Simon and Peter Gabriel I mean you know they're, they're people that I admired hugely and still do um and I don't think any one person really starts anything like a strand of some influential strand coming into our music. I think it was really part about partly how I felt as a person, and I was traveling more, and I was hearing things. I don't think I ever really heard music without thinking, how can I how can I use that? How can I when, when you're deeply affected by something, I think every songwriter sort of goes, what is it that's really tugging on me here? Or what is it that's scaring me or whatever, or making yeah. me want to dance? Uh, and you hop on it. You, you, you concentrate and try and uh, breathe some of those elements into your own music. And I think that that's really as much as I can claim to uh, have been at the forefront of it. What I think is true is that Redbox did sort of succeed in mixing pop music with these world influences. Yeah. Paul Simon did it, I think, in a much more... Um, I mean, I think Graceland is a wonderful record. I loved it at the time, and um, every time I hear a cut of it, I think it's it's still magnificent. 
Um, equally, Gabriel Four, which actually I was listening to when we were writing and making The Circle and the Square, which has a tribal thing. Uh, for me, it really was the meanings in the songs, lyrically, coming together with some of these ideas, but still making it a pop song that appealed to me. I don't think I ever aspired to making it as serious, perhaps, as Peter Gabriel, yeah. uh, or actually using that guy. Uh, who, who, you know, um, we were definitely taking those influences and twisting them in, in slightly odder ways. Sometimes I think it worked. Sometimes, I, looking back on it, I can hear where it didn't. Um, but I, but it, what it did do um, is open up a crack between us and Warner Brothers, who really didn't care for the fact we were mixing what they considered to be good commercial pop songs with an influence that would never, ever give us any kind of... Um, Success. Do you think that crack was sort of part of the reason why the album didn't perform as well as as Lean on Me had as a single? Yes. I mean, the album I think only made seventy three in the UK chart. I think that's right. I think it eventually ended up selling about seventy thousand, which, considering the the big hits that had preceded it, and I think um, th that's absolutely true. I think that happened. It actually happened earlier, really, in in the story, in that whenever we had a song that we felt really connected, they felt it was the one that they would choose least of all to do the job that we were then looking to do. So, for instance, when we were looking for a follow-up for Lean On Me, they wanted to use a song which I considered was very much an album track, whereas I thought we had much more connecting material. Um, when you sign to a major label, for, for me, one of the reasons, one of the things that I was most excited about was that we were put into the, the best studios, you know, with some very, very good and talented people. And again, I think they made some bad choices for us in who they sacked uh, throughout the first album because there were a few heads rolling. Um, looking back on it, I think it just, if you, it, to mix those elements, and uh, going back to Chenko, for instance, when we knew that song was pivotal was the moment we had mixed a Red Indian chant into it successfully. Um, using just bits of old records, we would have two or three record decks running around. It was a bit like early sampling, I suppose. Yeah. But we would mix two record decks. We had a stereo system in the living room and then Julian had an old decker. Uh, and, and it was, you know, we, I would play the song and we'd start two records off and see where it took us. Sometimes cordially too, and um, so you know, I th I think that eventually we found a style through that song, and I think it was therefore very important to the development of the band later that we we successfully made a pop song of it, which was after all what we were trying to do. And I think that that sort of discussion between you and the record company with regards to the sound actually. Uh, resulted in the next single, which was for America. Again, a very successful single, actually outsold Lean On Me. Yeah. But I think it was kind of almost written at the request of the label, is that right? Well, Rob, uh, Rob, who was the head of Warner Brothers in this country, uh, told me um, that he thought the band were too arty. Uh, we were English art school, that was it. And um, that we really needed to... He said, I, what I don't like is when you give a line of vocals to backing singers where it's a really good line of lyric. Some of your best lines you're getting other people to sing. And I said, well, that's because it's a question and answer. It's a sort of dialogue, you know. There's, there's me with one opinion and maybe them in some songs with a different opinion. So it wouldn't work if I sang it. But he, he, he wasn't going for it. Um, sorry, I've, I've lost the thread of your, your, your so question. So they sort of... I think there was a yes, reason in particular right. why that's they wanted right. you to so have he, that type he said, of song. what you really need to do is now go away and write something for America. Because Lean On Me was a great song, but it's not going to ever connect with people in the American kind of radio. You know, in, in American radio, it's not, never going to do it for you. So you need to go and write something for America. And it's probably actually really ungrateful of me to then go and write for America. To, because to he was trying to help. He was trying to help. The, the, the trouble for me was that I'd actually... Um, you know, when you went, there's certain songs, I think anybody here who'd had the good luck that I had to get have a good company behind me when I had had some songs that connected, because there are a lot of people who write songs and they never see the light of day because they just didn't have the right people. And I had the right people, and I'm now criticising them, which is ungrateful. But 
the problem the, when we discussed the rift was that I actually sort of lost confidence that they really knew what was good about the band. Because they wanted to cut all the tribal elements out of it, for me, it became much less interesting. So I was always fighting for the ones that I felt were more extreme. Um, I think it was an, an inevitability that we would eventually part company. But uh, while it worked, I think we managed to make some interesting sounding pop records where people perhaps went away with the tune in their heads and then only later went, actually, that's kind of quite anti-American. Yeah. I mean, the most famous moment on the, uh, to us on that song was that we turned up to do a, a young person's pop show, I won't name it, uh, in a northern town, I won't name it. <laughs> uh, and they had given for, for, for America, which was, was really, you know, it was not a, a kind of political invective so much as a, a kind of humorous response. We were already, we were very uh, well aware that um, we, were, we were dipping into Americana in our music, musical styles. I mean, North American Indian music and chants being mixed into our pop music, but also sometimes some country things and some bluegrass you know, I can hear bluegrass in For America, certainly. Yeah. Um, I think that to make that song, to turn it around and make it actually about America, and it wasn't really... It was about how America felt to us. So this is what we think. Yeah. Um, and I think that I, I had got carried away, really, with the joke of him saying, go and write something for America, and I thought, well, I'll write a song called For America, and I'll make it for America in the way that he doesn't think it, hasn't thought of, which was sort of, you know... A bit, it's a little bit up itself, actually. I can now see that, but at the time, I was trying to defend what I thought yeah, was very sure. serious territory, yeah. which was actually we have a sound, and I think you're deconstructing it. It was almost and that's worrying. Your, your that's fight worrying. back as such against yeah. being overly influenced. Yeah, and also they had said in a meeting, out of we will let you mix that track for America because that is so far away from what we think you should be doing that we don't even want to know, we don't want to book the studio time, you go and mix it. So we did for the album, and then they chose it as the next single, which is... But Rob wouldn't ever speak to you about things like that. <laughs> you know, it just happened. And ironically, sort of the one country where it wasn't really a hit was America itself. Yeah, I don't... Uh, yeah, is that ironic? <laughs> well, I suppose not, given the, the deeper content of the song. Yeah, I think here people... Um, I was just saying we turned up at a northern... Um, uh, this uh, this studio and they'd given all the children in the audience American flags to wave and we had to sort of say look thing is <laughs> uh, it was fine but uh, you know the, the, I think people in this country and in Europe generally just thought great a song about America and I think for the people who got really into it and into the album perhaps took a second look and a second listen and um, you know that to me is the power of pop music if we can hook them then, and I'm not trying to be subversive, and I never was, but I think it's it's a lovely mixture. I love Biko, you know, by Gabriel. I always thought, what a, how fantastic that song is, even if it was just about some kind of chocolate bar, I would love it. But in fact, it's about something magnificent. Yeah. So I suppose we were really trying to aim high, you know. I guess it's what a lot of the, the great pop acts of history have had that knack, if you like, for melding a commercial sound with a deeper concern in, in the lyrics. Yeah. So at the end of that campaign for the album, I think, as you've outlined, the, there was a great frustration between you and the label. Yes. Was that sort of the main reason why it was another four years before there was a red box release? Was it really four years? Yeah, I think it was... Between God. 86 well, and then 90. Well, I know we're 90. slow, but, you know, that is ridiculous. <laughs> Mind you, the tricky third album's been... <laughs> the <one. laughs> a little bit longer. Yeah, yeah. a little bit longer. Uh, OK, well, I think what happened was I actually got the hump after The Circle and the Square because I, I really felt that given two top ten singles... that, that when, It was not only just that they were top ten in this country. I think they were top ten pretty much worldwide where, you, where there is a top ten. Yeah. And we felt that they really needed to get behind the sound of the band and, and the, the concept of the band. Looking back now, because I did spend some time actually working with Max, who was by then our head of A&R, Max Hull, who's now at Universal. Um, I did, you know, I know A&R is not an easy gig. Um, and so, uh, and I probably wasn't that easy to deal with. I think both of us, all of us, probably could have handled it a little better. But I think what could have happened and, sh and would have perhaps meant that the group continued uninterrupted to now 
was that um, I really felt that unless it was something we were really passionate about and jumping up and down about in the studio, that I didn't really, you know, I thought there were better ways to spend my time, to be honest. And um, what I didn't know was that we could probably have walked out on, and gone on to another label, because I've since met a lot of people in the business who were big fans. But at the time, I was pretty down about it. So I went off and travelled for about uh, two years with my now wife, who was then my girlfriend. Uh, uh, we went sailing and, uh, you know, spent the money, basically, uh, from, from the <laughs> hit. The fruits. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and didn't feel terribly motivated to be doing anything else, uh, except that I did find myself writing songs. Uh, so when Max called me and said, look, you know, um, I'm now forming a label called East West Records, and if you want to make another Red Box album, you can do it on that. Therefore, Rob won't get the say. Uh, and I don't want to sound like I've got a downer on Rob. I see him from time to time, and I pump his hand. Uh, I like Rob, but we did see things very differently musically. So uh, that was a relief. Uh, we came back, and I spent about a year writing the songs, c completing my writing, and then we took about another six months to make it, and then, it, as you know, it takes a few months to come out. So I suppose there you have the four years. And did you sort of take a lot of persuading to put yourself back into that major label recording and release process? Uh, no, I think if Max had come back to me... Six, I was so completely devastated by the fact that Circle and the Square had come out and they hadn't promoted it because, I, you know, I put a lot of hard... Well, we all had, uh, and it happens. This happens, you know, to, to, to bigger groups than us. But it was something that took a bit of bouncing back from, really, um, as a songwriter. Uh, I was a bit confused, actually. And I, for a time, I don't think I really started a, a writing... You know, in the past, I had just written because I always tended to have a guitar or, or something in my hands. In promoting the record and the hits around the world, we had, uh, we had one of the sort of fundamental problems, I think, that pop music had once it went visual as well as audio, which was that we needed to be going around the world promoting the hit that had been here. Yeah. And in fact, what we really needed to be doing creatively was going back in and looking pale in our attic and writing songs that yeah. take time. Um, but I think we've ended up in a place where, therefore, pop music in the mainstream has sort of split away from great songwriters like Guillemot, you know, the guy, uh, is it Fife? Um, Fife Danger, you know, I mean, that guy should be... Every girl under 20 in this country should be in love with that guy, not the guy on X Factor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's the, the shift. Uh, and um, you know, I don't blame the media. The media runs with the will swim with the tide. But uh, you you wish guys like that at that age could have some of the exposure that we enjoyed, yeah. uh, that everybody saw on one night. You know. So the first after you completed that recording of Motive, which was the second album, yeah. the first single was a, a track called Train. Yeah. Which again, similar to your earlier experiences, it received a lot of good. Uh, response at radio and TV in the press, yeah. but strangely, it was recalled from retailers. I think almost immediately on the Monday. I think yeah, yeah, yeah. Is can you tell us why it was? Do, do you actually know the the, the main reasons? I, I don't really understand the reasons I've been given for it. Right, but it was the crucial factor in us walking. I mean, I think Rob would say. I got rid of Red Box, but actually kind of Red Box were walking as the meeting was happening. I think it was pretty apparent when we went to the meeting after they re they pulled that single and said, we've sent the album out, we've put the album out, which we didn't consider was really finished. Um, you know, that was a very poor moment. It, yeah. it can't look any bleaker than going from having hits and everybody loving the band to sort of trying to convince people that we were worth it. Uh, just felt like a, the wrong curve all round and had for a while. I so think, I think I it think kind what, of completely derailed that whole album campaign for you. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> it was unintentional. Good. It was unintentional. Yeah, it did. It did. It absolutely. The wheels came off because uh, we had the album, you know, the album was at the artwork stage as far as we were concerned. But I think they, they were in trouble. East, I think East West, it wasn't going that well um, at that time. 
so you know they probably had their own reasons. I think cr on a creative level, we were very shocked by it because we thought that the single would do very well. Actually, interesting that you say it got good reviews. I think it's the only time we got good reviews on a single. Was uh, we went on Jukebox Jury, which was uh, was Jules Holland used to host it. That's right. And got unanimous thumbs up from everybody and real enthusiasm. You know, you, you can tell after you've been around a bit and you've written a few songs that didn't work out and you've written a few that have, when people really are, are hungry for what you do and you can tell the fake in that. Yeah. And so um, we, we really felt good after that. We felt that people got it, um, that it was a song that represented our world. You know, the song is the train. Um, and, and I think what I'd always try to do with Redbox singles is make them a big idea. You know, there were no B, B movie ideas on, on our albums. It was the best ever review we got was somebody said, um, and they didn't particularly like the album, but they said it's like Shirley Bassey meets the Zulu Nation, and they didn't get on. <laughs> it's just <laughs> <Very> fantastic. <good. laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, you know, uh, that was it, really. Yeah, I think that was... At that point, 91, yeah. you and Julian kind of decided that that was the end of the band at that point. Yeah, that, that, but rather than try and get people to, uh, to, to um, you know, work hard on our behalf, given that we'd done our best, we, we felt there was always this play of uh, that they had a very strong opinion of how we should sound. And I, and I think, to be fair to Rob, Rob recognised us as uh, good songwriters. I think he just thought we were we were a bit arty, and for him that stood in the way of larger success. For us, it was the key. It was the key thing that defined the group and made us different, which yeah. I think is the key to big success. But you know, that's the way it goes. So what happened to the two of you after the end of the band as such? What did you go on and do with well, your Julian lives? Well, Julian went into A and R and became a eventual head of A and R at EMI. Okay. Um, I think most notably he signed Eternal. Right, or one of his things, and he s continues to work in within sort of UK, uh, what I would call pop R and B. Uh, that's his thing. Uh, he's in management. Um, I, uh, I think again we we took a trip or two, and um, ha had a rethink. What I think happened really was that on the second record, Max said. In order not to inflame Rob, and because, you know, Rob thought that whole tribal thing was a bit arty, in order to not inflame him, why not tone that element down? Make a record that's a sort of mature statement at this point. Yeah. Um, so I did. That's what I thought we did, and we, we did tone it down. And to be honest, my heart wasn't quite in it, although I think there are some good tracks on the record. Uh when we delivered it, they said, yeah, but it just sort of needs that big idea, like a sing a red box single. So I wrote Train, thinking and added it to the album, thinking that this would do the trick. I think that they had lost confidence in being able to um, deal with us, actually. Um, and I had lost confidence that they really got what the group was about. So I think Julian and I felt he he made a very uh, basic decision, even actually before we completed uh, we were uh, completed making the record, that he wanted to try and be a producer or an A and R man and get into the business side. I made a very conscious decision when we went when we all went our different ways that I would continue to make music. And after about a year, Max Hull called me and said, "What are you doing?" And I said, "Well, I'm uh, trying to build a studio at home and see if I can make a record without you bastards." <laughs> And uh, he said, good, good. Do you want to come and do that same thing, but just come and be part of East West? And so I went back uh, uh, as a sort of uh, poacher turned gamekeeper, I suppose. Worked with the NR department. Um, they helped me set up a studio. And I began to work and write with some of the artists on the label. Uh, and often people that they were considering signing. Uh, we'd just get together and write for a couple of weeks or whatever. Uh, which was great, you know, that was good, but always in the back of my mind, I kind of thought, you know, sometimes I would come up with a good idea in somebody else's session, and, and I would think that is, you know, I wish I'd thought of that when I was doing making Red bo Box records. So yeah. I suppose even then, subconsciously, I was holding back, which isn't really fair. I was an absolutely dreadful A&R person. <laughs> I really was, because 
you know, I kind of knew what I wanted to hear. Yeah. I suppose the musician in me never really gave up to be good enough, to be to be good at that job. Yeah. So, 18 years go by? Well, not quite. Um, I, a couple of years went by after the demise of the group and right. the motive fiasco of yeah. it going out but then being withdrawn. Um, and I, I think seven or eight years working at East West for Max uh, and learning how to master records and how to edit with Pro Tools. It was all new technology, really, uh, in throughout the 90s. Um, and I had some amazing experiences working with people all over the world. Um, which really just kind of reignited my hunger. It's taken me this long because I didn't want to go to a record company and say, I'm in your hands, I need the money, whether it's £100,000 or £50,000 by today's prices, because yeah. you know, we've, all, we've all learned how to do this in a more efficient way. Yeah. Um, I didn't want to be cap in hand to somebody. And have them and, sort of influencing how the record sounds. Well, I've missed them them uh, being in, you know an influence on my uh, efforts. To be honest, it would be great to have some good A and R input. And occasionally, I've met A and R people who became associated with the group. In fact, one of them I first met at Cherry Red, which is John Hollingsworth, who was the head of A and R when we released Chenko on Cherry Red in the eighties. And he was a very inspiring and enthusiastic man. He didn't know technically how we made a record but he knew when we made a good one and he knew i think what was good about the group so i miss that now um and that has taken a while it we wrote 50 odd 60 songs in order to record 30 in order to choose 20 to mix in order to make the tw you know it's a, a process of distillation for us and we're quite prolific so eventually we've got to 2010 and this year will be the release of the third Red Box album. Yes. Um, not 100% confirmed, but fingers crossed, we'll be full circle, and it's back on that damn fine label again, Cherry Red Records. We really hope that that comes about. Uh, the album's called Plenty. Yes. So I guess the, the sort of obvious question is, why was now the right time to come back? Um, I don't know that... Uh, well, it's now, firstly, because it's finished now. And uh, anybody who's ever worked with Redbox will tell you, A, we're not quick at making a record. But secondly, we won't be pushed about in terms of whether we think it's finished or not. I think this is a fundamental problem. In the 80s, you really needed to be getting product out there and to fit the model that we were with with a major label. We needed to have, a, have our faces around Europe on TV. And it was brilliant fun. But it did mean that I then took another year out because I wasn't happy with where our songs were, yeah. which, it, which irritated them, and I can understand that. I, I think, in some ways, maybe that's how why Stock Aitken and Waterman went kind of, you know, if we, if we write the songs and he produces them and then we, he markets them and we get somebody beautiful in and they can go off and do the promotion, we can still be making our, the music. Yeah. You know, you know that you, how this went. Um, so... Uh, I think what's happened for me is that it's taken me this long to firstly know how to make a record myself in its entirety. Right. And to really have um, enough space in my life. Uh, and I owe my wife a huge debt because her business took off and it enabled me to, to you know, do outside production jobs a little less, which meant that the album got made a little sooner. Um, so we're, we're, you know huge debt of love to my wife for this and without sort of giving too much away before people hear it for sort of fans of red box from the 80s how does this album differ in terms of a how you sort of approach the writing of it and b how it's ended up sounding yeah okay um fantastic question uh Basically, I think there are more similarities, and I'm being convinced of this, the more people that I play it to who have a knowledge of the previous material. In other words, fans, as you, as you know, we met um, a number of the fan club last Saturday because we played the album to them in a recording studio and then we played a little set. It was brilliant. Um, but the, I think that it will appeal to anybody who liked anything by Redbox. Um, one of the funny things that happened to us when we were at Warner's was that one day, the head of marketing sh showed us the graphs for um, 
the sales, the demograph for each of their acts, where there was a very distinct mountain range uh, peak in each in each graph for Simply Red and Tanita Tikaram and Chris Rear, all the bands on the label. Um, and ours was like a flat line. And it was basically who buys our records. It's uh, They had a problem because they didn't have a niche to put us in. I think that... And I said, well, all different types of buyer records, all different ages, and isn't that what a pop group is? Um, but apparently not. So uh, I think there are more similarities with all that um, than there are differences. But essentially the difference is, I think it's simpler. Part of that is having time to consider things in a way that I didn't in the 80s. Uh, the, the power to review when you own the studio is perhaps the greatest value in the whole event, in the whole experience. The downside, of course, is that there's no deadline and there's nobody pushing you on. And I think you have to somehow form, when you, when you self-produce and you are responsible for paying the money out and making the studio work, you have to be, it's part realist and part fantasist. Yeah. Because so many of us just wouldn't get past the first 30% of the work that's involved with it. Um, so I think it's a simpler record, which is partly one's own studio. Um, you tend to come down to the size of the place. That said, there are a number of bigger tracks, which are bigger ideas, as, as, you, as you've heard. And I think um, those work pretty well too. I think anyone who liked Circle in the Square will find... Uh, tracks on an emotional level that are very similar only this time I think it's a more personal set of circumstances that I've written about and that's really because you know it is my life now that's pressing upon me rather than the wider scheme when I was a student and do you feel sort of from a personal point of view that there's some kind of case of unfulfilled potential in terms of that amount of time between motive and now, do you feel that there's a, like a, it's almost a scratch that you've got to itch in putting this album out? Yeah, I do. I think that's well put. Um, I've got a lot of time to make up for. Um, An itch that you've got I've to not, scratch. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> no, that's right. Uh, I think that working for other people and producing them was was a fantastic experience but also quite frustrating because you, you could sort of sit, I could hear how I would try and pull the, the 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 idea off or the track off of course you can't do that and the best producers in the world are the ones who can really make it what the artist hears um even now I think that that's true so I wasn't particularly good at producing other people they did tend to come out sounding a bit like red box which which sometimes people liked but I think in the back of my mind, I always knew that I would uh, come back to it. It just took me really three times longer to build the studio and make the, rec the record than it should have done. Had I been in a position of strength and uh, a rich man, then it would have been maybe a year. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't, it was several. And Julian isn't, isn't involved on this No, Julian this is a, still a good friend. I mean, Julian hasn't been involved really since... He, he wasn't involved in the recording of Motive. Right. Uh, so Julian and I, my collaboration was really the circle and the square, um, and then, um, but have, that said, Julian did the same job as a good friend of mine on Motive, which is to sit with me and listen to the demos and go, that bit's great, but I'm not sure that that bit's good. Uh, and he did. He's done the same thing with this record. You know, he's he's one of the friends that I play my my efforts to. But you you have now sort of formed a new band as such. Well, again, formed is is the right word. It's evolved uh, from a circle of friends, which is precisely how both previous lineups of the band have have come about. We've ended up jamming and playing whenever we get together. Uh, in the old days, we used to play football, and now we sit around like fat gits playing music. <laughs> so I think that's produced some songs, uh, which we felt were better than just jamming with your friends um, and I've always had I've always sort of felt that no matter where recorded music ends up as a as a marketable commodity because as as you know so well that it's in such a state of flux at the moment it's hard to see how we make this work yeah that frightens me but at the same time I sort of know that I'm going to be doing it it's it's what we do now uh, and I'm glad that I've been able to come back to it 
and 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 have another bash you know stay in the ring well good luck with it you know we hope that uh, that plenty is a great success thank you um hope that we're involved in some way in that me too and um thanks very much for coming and talking to Not us today all. it's really been a real pleasure it. thanks and join us again soon for more cherry red tv